post-lunch session, so let's try to make it as interesting as possible, right? <laughs> All right. OK, uh, very happy to be here. And uh, my name is Sundar Ramalingam, and I manage the deep learning practice for uh, NVIDIA based out of Bangalore. And uh, very happy to be here and talk to you about uh, uh, the dream that, uh, that every employee, every management uh, um, member, every company, every corporate, every small start startup, all the way up to the big conglomerate has. How do I build an AI-first company uh, which, which has been working extremely successfully? It is not that people are suffering or the company is doing bad or whatever. No, I mean, everything is going fine. But then there, is, there are all these, these esoteric terms that are, that are uh, most misused terms in the industry today that are, that are floating around. And uh, looks like everybody else other than me, me seems to be adopting that. How do I, I, I adopt to the new, new methodology of working? How do I change my existing successful way of working? That's, that's the challenge there, existing successful way of working to something entirely new, which may, may or may not have been tried by me so far. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next 35 minutes or so. So let's take it a step back. The area of data analytics, I'm using a more generic term. Let me not even go to AI, machine learning, deep learning, and all. The area of data analytics has undergone a vast change in the recent times. This is something which I, I assume that all of us know. Um, the heuristic techniques continue to be there. The if, then, else, the very, very basic if, then, else way of working. If this is the condition, this is the outcome. Yes, this is the outcome. A very time proven, 100%, you know what is happening. Um, you, you can explain the output of any program if you follow this, this, this way of working. And then comes machine learning. And in fact, I mean, uh, many of you uh, may know machine learning and deep learning are nothing new. They have been there for like uh, several decades now. Okay. So machine learning, the one fundamental prerequisite is that you need to have structured data. Machine learning works very well when you have structured data. And uh, what we call as feature engineering, say, for example, if object identification, a very simple task uh, achieved by all of us, is, is, my, is, is my agenda, um, the feature engineering or extraction of features is done by manual technologies. Like I handcraft the features that define an object. Okay. I need to be a domain expert, and I should be able to visualize the features that go into an object, and I should be able to handcraft the features that go into an object if object deduction is going to be my, uh, my agenda. And then comes deep learning, which actually changed the entire paradigm of how machine learning uh, had been working until, until then. One, one um, statement which I want to make here is that, I mean, all, please keep in mind that, in fact, there was one question from somewhere here, like what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning and things like that. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Okay? If, I, I, if I imagine machine learning to be a big circle, deep learning is a smaller circle contained in, inside the bigger circle called machine learning. Throughout my talk, when I mention about machine learning and when I mention about deep learning, what I mean is deep learning and the other traditional machine learning techniques. That's what I mean. I mean, every time I may not be repeating traditional machine learning techniques or conventional machine learning techniques. When I say machine learning, that's what I mean. And then there is deep learning. So deep learning, the big advantage that deep learning gave you is that it enabled you to, to, to handle unstructured data in a much easy, easy, easier fashion. You can just, data is data. I mean, it, it could be structured, it could be unstructured. Deep learning doesn't, doesn't care. It, 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 it can consume both the type of, types of data with, with equal efficiency. And number two, instead of handcrafting features, instead of doing feature engineering by your own um, manual methodologies because you are, an, you are a domain expertise, you have domain expertise in that field, what you do is you write algorithms that enable the machine to look at large amounts of data, huge amounts of data, and pick out the patterns and the commonalities that are hidden inside the data. Okay? I mean, I repeat, the, the, the algorithms that you create look at large amounts of data, huge amounts of data, and understand the patterns and the commonalities that are hidden inside the data. And when that is done, that is nothing but the features that define the data. And hence, features are learned by the algorithm rather than you going and handcrafting the features yourself. Okay. That is the fundamental difference. Since there was a question, I thought it, it's prudent for me to, 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 to address that before I jump into the, uh, the deeper parts of the presentation. Um, uh, so that's the fundamental difference between, between the traditional machine learning technique and a deep learning technique. And this really changed the way AI had been working for very long. Now, I mentioned earlier that deep learning has been there for very long. I mean, several decades it has been there. So what happened in the recent six, seven, eight years time that really led to the rebirth of deep learning? Why, why, why do many of us did not even know the word until about 10 years ago? The reasons is, uh, there are two reasons for that. 
First one, deep learning needs data. No data, no deep learning. All right? Data means, I mean, it's, it's not like small data. Humongous amounts of data are needed or pertaining to that, that particular domain for deep learning to become uh, successful. And data became available very recently from two different domains, first two different streams, I would say, industrial IoT and social media. That Both these domains pumped in a lot of data and data became available. The second one is the brutal computational power that is needed for deep learning models to run. Okay? It's brutal. I mean, huge amounts of computational power is needed. And that computational power also became available thanks to a lot of technological advancements that, are ha that happened in the area of computing, mainly from the GPU computing perspective. And both these things happened together, availability of data and the availability of computational power needed for solving deep learning models. And both of them led to the rebirth of deep learning, and that is why we are all here talking about this topic today. So, how do I build up an AFS organization? So where, where is deep learning used? I mean, the, the answer is there. I mean, I would say this is a redundant slide these days because all of us know it's everywhere. It's, it's as simple as that. I mean, starting from recommendation engines to cloud and infrastructure and medicine and biology, hey, media and entertainment, speech uh, recognition, power processing, security and defense, all the, you know, the smart city, safe city projects that are happening today. And uh, last but not the least, the epitome of deep learning today is autonomous machines. Okay, we would not be talking about driverless cars and things like that if not for the deep learning techniques. So I'm not going to spend any time on this because this is something which I, I'm sure all of us know. Now, uh, just, to, mm, uh, just to drive home the point, I mean, to, to what extent deep learning has reached out. I thought of uh, um, taking two, two very nice examples. Okay, I'll just run, the, run them through. So what you're seeing here is, is this a mannequin, right? It, it, it's, 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 it's a model. And uh, these are used for as animated uh, characters. Now, if this has to, I'm sorry. Uh, would you play this for me, please? Yeah, thank you. Listen up. I'll explain what Train it does. your warehouses is our main objective. Alexei, you and your men will do that. You have to go in and out very quick. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. So here what happens is interesting. This is the reverse of lip syncing. So what I have done is I've created, not me, I mean, whoever created it. I mean, what I have done is I have created a, a model and I have defined the degrees of freedom for the jaws to move. And you give it any text, you give it any language, the animation happens in sync with, with what is being spoken. It could be anything. And obviously you can choose the nice um, voice that you want to hear. So the, the, the problem of, you know, Creating an animation to suit the needs of the dialogue is now done away with. All I have to do is, I need to define the degrees of freedom for the jaw. I mean, jaw cannot go in very unnatural ways. So long as the DOFs of the jaw is, is, is defined, you give it any language, any dialogue, any text, it, it, automates, it automatically gets animated. This is, this is amazing. This is like really fascinating. Now look at this. Yeah, one more. So here, what is happening is that, this mannequin also has, I mean, I have different degrees of freedom for this. And the terrain is defined. Now, this mannequin learns to walk through the terrain. Okay, Like how I would learn to walk through a terrain. Give me any terrain because I know where I need to be balanced while walking, where I need to, you know, um, move my, my arms so that I don't fall. I mean, I get better balance, things like that. How I learn as a human being. And I can walk through any terrain. Deep learning, um, reinforcement learning, etc., have enabled the mannequin also to learn these things. And now the good thing is that you created a, a mannequin. You, of course, you need to define the degrees of freedom. How much can the can the hands move and the and the legs move? And then you, this terrain can be replaced by any terrain in the world. The mannequin will walk without any problems on that. Will run, will jump, whatever it needs to be done. So here, what is happening here is that this is automation. This is what we mean by automation. Okay, so. That is, all these are also like tremendous achievements uh, that, that have been brought forward very recently by deep learning. Now, it's easier to show nice animated features on the, on the screen so that it looks very catchy and, uh, and, 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 and looks good. But what happens behind the scenario? I mean, how is this achieved? This is achieved through these very, very complex mathematical models, which we call as deep neural networks, right? Now, this is an interesting feature. 
um, what, what, what is being shown here. So this sort of, you know, shows the way uh, the, the complexity of the neural networks have evolved over the recent times. So let me try to explain this slide. 2015, the biggest model of that year happened to be the Microsoft ResNet. I mean, many of you who are working in Vision would know this. And that needed seven exaflops of computing. The very next year, uh, from a, though from a different domain, during that year, the biggest model of that year happened to be the Baidu speech, which changed the way speech had been working until then. And that needed 20 exaflops of computing. The very next year, 2017, Google came out with its uh, um, NMT, Neural Machine Translator, which needed 100 exaflops of computing. And what was 60 million hyperparameters attached to the Microsoft ResNet grew up to 8,700 million parameters just two years later. And today, any guesses who is, which is the biggest network that has really changed the way deep learning has been working? Any, any, anybody can help me? I can give a hint that it's, it's an NLP one. I mean, sorry, BERT, yes, I heard BERT. Thanks, I mean, I don't know who, who said BERT. Yes, that BERT. BERT is the biggest one today. And today, I mean, what was 8,700 million parameters until a uh, couple of years ago is 1.5 billion parameters today. And then bigger number networks are already there called GP2 and all, which has taken it to even further uh, um, levels. So essentially what is happening is that the complexity of the neural networks are, are, are going in big, big way. And it's just not the complexity. The, the types of neural networks that are being used are also growing in, in unprecedented way. Gone are the days when only you know, CNNs and RNNs are used for deep learning problems. Today, everybody, in the last four years' time, newer methodologies, newer networks have, have born. I mean, the GANs, the generative adversarial networks, is the big thing today. And then reinforcement learning. And there are many, many other networks. I don't have time to read through them. But you know, these are all, many of them you might not have even heard. So what is happening is that, is it like a, some sort of an increase in complexity unnecessarily? No, not really. All these types of developments have resulted in ensuring that you get much, much better accuracy out of your deep learning models, out of your, your neural networks than what is available today. And taking the accuracy from, let's say, an 80% to 90% is easier comparatively than taking it from 95% to 96%. Okay, that 1% improvement in, perf in, in from when, it, when you want to move from 95 to 96, it's much, much more complex than taking it from 80 to 90, right? So this has resulted in an enormous explosion in terms of the technology that is available for ensuring that your deep learning models run in, in its, in, in its, in its, in, at its level best and gives you the accuracy levels that you are looking for. Now, so, so, so far we have been talking about the, the, uh, the, the technology. I mean, how it has evolved in the recent times, so what has led to the revolution, and how the te technology has changed in the recent times. So keeping all this in mind, taking all these complexities in mind, how do I build a company which is my AI first company, which, 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 where AI pervades, it permeates across the organization. It becomes a practice, that's important. Today, IT is a practice, right? I mean, nobody thinks, I mean, how do I manage IT? How do I deploy IT in the organization? It's a practice. It's a well-established practice. Like that, can AI become a practice? Okay. Yes, there are a few platform considerations to be there. The first one, obviously, is the productivity. We all know that, I mean, good, good for all of us, I guess, is that AI talent is expensive, right? And scaling the performance. The more and more you become successful in deployment of AI, more and more, you need to have the right AI DL expertise and innovation. The right partners who can give you this expertise, who can give you this innovation, who can take you in that, in that direction. And number two, you have to be very, very clear on the software stack. For any successful AI practice to be established, the software that goes into it, the software that helps you build the infrastructure is extremely, extremely important. There is so much good work done by the big companies like Google's and Microsoft's and NVIDIA for that matter. And it's all, the good thing about this, this particular domain is that, another, that's one, of the, one more reason for this domain to grow so fast in the recent past is that everything, not everything I would say, most of the things are available to you free when it comes to software, okay? Super duper frameworks which are extremely powerful, which brings down the work of a, of a developer to a big extent, it's, it's available for you free. But the trick is to ensure that you identify the one which, 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 uh, which suits your organization and will help your workforce. And of course, the hardware considerations of that. So 
One more statement that I want to make here is that throughout the part of my presentation, whenever I'm going to talk about infrastructure, what I mean is just not the hardware. It's hardware is one part of it, no doubt about it, but it's a lot of software that goes into it. That is what makes up an infrastructure. It's hardware plus software that makes up an infrastructure. Now, there are many other infrastructural conditions also that needs to be taken into account. One thing that, that goes without saying is that AI needs, AI computing needs brutal computational power. It's, 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 it's unimaginably big when compared to what, what has been available until about a few years ago. It has to be an extraordinarily compute intensive infrastructure that goes into it. In addition to that, there are other considerations like how do I do design my storage, how do I, where do I keep the data, where do I keep the, keep the compute, where, what, what softwares are needed, et cetera, et cetera. There are many other things that, that go into this. And then what we call, I'll be talking a little about it in the subsequent slides. So we are moving fast from what we call as the weak nodes to strong nodes. All right. And there are many, uh, for example, um, for A computation, if, if X number of petaflops of computation is what is needed, that can be achieved by, by combining, by building a cluster of, let us say, 100 servers. Or can that be achieved by using just two machines in that way? Instead of using a very large number of weak systems, weak machines, will I be able to build the same infrastructure, get the same amount of computational power by reducing the number of systems that can be done? So many reference architectures are available which help you to do that. One very popular question that, 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 that I often come across is that an on-prem versus cloud. I mean, should I set up my own infrastructure or should I go to the cloud? Because, I mean, there are very popular cloud service providers who give you a lot of good computational power on the cloud also. So my suggestion here is that, my recommendation here is that if you are into serious AI computing, if you are into serious deep learning computing, in the long run, cloud may work out to be quite expensive for you, okay? It makes a lot of sense to, to, to set up things on-prem, okay? That, that's how it operates. But then it always is the, is the, is the question of the, the advantages and the disadvantages of cloud versus on-prem, which are very obvious. I don't have to narrate that to you. But keep in mind that if it is into, you're into serious deep learning computing, if you're into serious deployment problems, then cloud might work out to be quite expensive for you in the long run. I just wanted to caution you about it. Now, so how does the software ecosystem um, look like? So this is how a typical AI infrastructure software ecosystem looks like. At the bottom of everything is the, the parallel computing hardware, which happens to be GPUs here. Now, of course, I'm an employee of NVIDIA. I'm a proud employee of NVIDIA, and I'm happy about it. But the truth, I mean, I'm not telling this because I'm an, I'm an NVIDIA employee. The truth here is that many of the technological advancements that have happened in the recent past is NVIDIA has been at the center stage of it. Because of the sheer, na sheer nature of the GPU, the GPU has been architected to be a parallel computing engine. Okay, it is a parallel computing engine. So you take a very large problem and you break the large problem into a large number of small threads and run each of these threads in parallel. And then at the end of the, um, of the run, you collate them together and look at a result which, is, which makes meaning to you. Okay. So how do I do this parallelization? How do I do the high performance computing in the most efficient way? How do I parallelize parallel operations? I mean, how do I, well, first of all, my, my objective is to, is to create a very, very parallel, a very highly efficient parallel way of working. I have done that, I have achieved that. Now, is it possible for me to run multiple such parallel operations in parallel? That's what I mean by paralyzing parallel operations. So all these things play a big role when it comes to GPU computing, when it comes to AI computing. And a lot of software goes into that. There are some extremely good software bundles, the libraries and SDKs that are available. So at the bottom of everything is the parallel computing hardware, okay, GPUs in most of the cases. And then uh, many of you might have heard about these libraries which are called as CUDA, which is the, the backbone of of, of how GPU computing works. CUDA is nothing but the, the software parallel computing library for us. And on top of CUDA is built the mul multiple you know, software libraries. I mean, it, whether you are doing machine learning, you are doing deep learning, or you are doing traditional high performance computing, or whether you are virtualizing GPUs so that you don't have to have your individual systems, each of them equipped with the GPUs, but you consolidate everything in the data center and, uh, and um, 
do a remote access, all these things, all these libraries and, and bundles help you in achieving that. And then comes the, the, this nice layer, which is called as the applications and the framework layer. And as I said, tremendous amount of work has gone into, into this layer. And, and um, big companies, great companies have, have put in a lot of effort into this. And this, this, these layers have automated most of the tasks in a big way. That, uh, the likes of TensorFlows and MXNet and Microsoft CNTK and Cafe Theano Torch, etc. And on top of that lies your application layer. And as deep learning developers, as AI developers, your, your job is to, is to ensure that you do the top layer well and ensure that all the stacks that, that are below the top layer uh, all the way even up to the framework level is all automated. It is all done in, in, the, in a most efficient way and given to you so that you don't have to worry about what is happening in the, in the bottom layers. Now, another very, uh, a very important thing that I would like to, you to keep in mind is that training, deep learning training is more or less settled now, right? It's, it's, it's getting settled now. Now comes the area of inferencing. I've created great models that run extremely well in the data center, but how do I, uh, I deploy it in the most efficient way? Let's take a very common example of, of face recognition. That's a very, very common problem today. A lot of people are trying to solve it and, 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 and quite successful as well. Okay, I have created great models which run well in the data center, but how do I deploy it in, uh, on, a, on a railway platform? How do I deploy it on police chalks? How do I deploy it in the, in the airport? That is where the, 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 the big challenge comes because the models that you create in the data center for your deep learning, um, using deep learning methodologies for your face recognition, they, those have heavy compute resources. But the, the camera that is deployed, that is being deployed in a, in a railway platform or, a, or, a, or you know, an airport are not going to have that, that, that much of computational uh, power. So this is a big, big problem. And how do I, I deploy it in the most efficient way? And how do I build an ensemble of, of models? Okay, it's not going to be one model which that does one task at any point in time. In many, many places, there you need to have a multitude of models that work in unison, and the output from one model has to go as the input for the second model. So all these things give you enormous comp complexity when it comes to inferencing or deployment. And there are many softwares that are available. So I'm going to, for the rest of the uh, talk, which is another 12 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a lot about the software bundles that are available that make your deep learning um, tasks much easier than doing it, doing most of the things yourself. One such very important thing is what we call as the TensorRT. Okay? And basically what it does is it translates the heavy trained models into much lighter weight inferenceable models that can be deployed. Right? Um, I mean, looks like it's a major problem for many of you because I see a lot of cameras being employed and a lot of you are taking pictures of this. Very glad to see that. The, the, th this is a real problem. I mean, I, how do I, I have a very, very good model that runs well in the data center, but the compute resource I have in the data center is not available at, at edge. How do I translate the heavy model into a much lighter weight model which can be deployed? And that is what this library does. Okay? And once again, all this is free. And the target uh, platform could be anything. The source platform could be anything. So long as you have a nice translator that, 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 that makes the, the, the model lighter that can be deployed, that would be the dream of, of everybody who is working on an inferencing engine. And then comes the video analytics part of it. DeepStream SDK. This is a fantastic SDK. If you are uh, employing um, deep learning techniques on vision problems, could be images or could be videos, this is a, this is a fantastic uh, library. Please make use of it. I mean, all these are a lot of millions of dollars of, of investment have gone into this, and, and these are all available for you free of cost. I would really urge you to, 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 to make use of this, these, these libraries and these SDKs so that you don't end up reinventing the wheel. You, 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 you don't have to do something which has already been done by experts in this field. All right. The last but not the least, so far my talk has been always been focused on the deep learning part of it. But that doesn't mean that the traditional machine learning techniques are going to die any, any, any soon. It, it, will, it will not die. It, it will not die. So what happens there? I mean, do these fantastic techniques, do they get employed to that domain also? The answer is yes. So before I start explaining how it works there, let's look at the uh, traditional workflow in a, in a data sciences pipeline. 
Okay. So what do we do in a typical data sciences? You could be from any domain. It could be from healthcare. It could be from surveillance. You could be from um, speech. It doesn't matter. Um, this is the typical workflow that defines a data a data sciences a data analytics pipeline. The first one is that we have a data lake, and the data lake gets gets information from multiple sources, multiple formats, multiple sources that go into the data lake. And then comes a very, very different, difficult task for me, is to how do I do the extraction of the data that is, that is of interest to me? Okay? How do I, 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 I take out the one which, which makes sense to me? And the ETL part of it, the extraction, transformance, and unloading, if it is a streaming data. And how do I define the data frames? Okay? How do I define the data frames and extract the data that makes, makes sense for me? And once you have done that, then you employ your, your analysis techniques. The, the techniques could, could either be a deep learning technique or it could be a machine learning technique. We have done that. And then how do you look at the results in a, in a, in a meaningful way? How do I build a graph which, which makes sense, which, 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 which connects the, 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 the multiple uh, you know, um, factors that, that have an influence on the outcome, and finally, how do I visualize the results? Now, all these techniques, whatever we have talked about so far, okay, that define a data, a data pipeline, the, all these are getting accelerated through the, the, the modern techniques today. And that package is called as RAPIDS. Okay? So I would request all of you to please do explore this. If you are into traditional machine learning techniques, if you are into data analytics, uh, don't even have to be using uh, deep learning. Okay, that's that's fine. If you are into traditional machine learning techniques, traditional data analytics, advanced data analytic techniques, please do make uh, to, uh, to do explore this. Just go and search for Rapids or EAP ideas, and you will see a lot of fantastic libraries that help you to do it in a much much more efficient, much accelerated way than what you have been doing so far. For example, there are libraries for, for QDF. For, for defining data frames, QAML for your machine learning algorithms, and uh, QGraph for your visualization techniques and things like that. Now, I keep on telling that they, they, they run in an accelerated fashion, right? So how accelerated is accelerated? Okay, let's try to define some numbers here. When I say in a much accelerated fashion, what I mean here is that something, let us say, a problem which has been running for, let's say, 10 days, okay, does not come down to five days, or does not come down to four days, or does not come down to one day. What I mean here is that a problem which has been running for 10 days comes down to a couple of hours, or maybe lesser. That is what we mean by accelerated computing. Okay? And once again, that is not a luxury. It is not that, I mean, do I really need, need that much of, uh, of, of a computational power? Do I really need, need that practically? No, it's not luxury at all. It is a necessity. If you have to build an AI um, first company, these are all needs because now we are talking about changing the existing workflows to the newer methodologies of workforce, and this is how it, 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 it works. So, a lot of great changes have happened in the computational, power, uh, computational world, and uh, some newer uh, techniques uh, have, uh, have enabled very, very powerful machines uh, that are being born today. Um, for example, what used to be a data center uh, that, that used to look like this, Thanks to the employment of, of, of new AI supercomputing machines, many of you might be aware of this. There is, there, are, there is the DGX family of systems, the DGX1, DGX Station, DGX2, etc., which are AI supercomputing systems. This, these are super powerful machines. For example, this is a GPU-enabled machine, the DGX1, what we are seeing on the, on, the, on the screen now. If you were to build an equivalent machine with only CPUs, with no GPUs at all, you would need about 200 plus of those systems. Okay. So the computational power of 200 plus systems has been compressed into one server, what you, what you are seeing on the screen today. Okay. And this is what we mean by strong nodes. Thanks to the developments of this, like, uh, developments like this, what used to look like this is today looking like this. Okay. Before and after. Right? So, the cost of computation has gone down drastically, right? Instead of building huge data centers with with a big, large number of clusters, hundreds of machines, which 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 is going to cost you millions of dollars, uh, or if not millions of, at least hundreds of thousands of dollars, it has come down drastically. And instead of building something like this, you could achieve the same thing by building something like this. Okay? So these are all the the developments that have happened in the recent computational world today, and building an AI. First company needs the adoption 
to of, of these technologies, the, the knowledge about these technologies, both in terms of hardware, in terms of computation, in terms of software that I talked a lot about, and embracing all these techniques will really help you in, in, in building an AI-first organization. That's what I wanted to, 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 to talk today. And uh, we, in fact, have uh, 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 um, some detailed, uh, I, I mentioned about a lot of software. I mentioned about TensorRT. I mentioned about DeepStream SDK. I mentioned about uh, a few other software also. So live demonstrations of the software are available outside the, just outside the, uh, the auditorium. Um, our experts are there. You can talk to them and find out more uh, about uh, all of the software. I have three more minutes. If you have any questions or anything like that, I can take them for three more minutes. Yes, sir. I think you're getting the mic, yeah. Yeah, a nice session. Thank and you. Uh, the question that I have is more to do with what, what you started with. You said that the cloud cost could be prohibitive in the long run, right? But then would you rather replace all your existing data centers, rip and replace with this? There will be a cost attached to that as well. Right. right. At the same time, in the case of machine learning, it's an iterative approach. Right. Right. So how do you kind of balance both these out? Sure. So if you are trying to get a hang of machine learning, try to get a hang of deep learning, you want to experiment with a few things, you want to have a few um, young engineers who want to play around with and all, yes, it, 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 it still is a viable option. Cloud is, this is by, by my view, I mean, I'm not, I mean, there's no hard and fast tool. I mean, we all know that it's not like a hard and fast tool. Uh, this is, these are my, my views. And uh, whatever I'm sharing is through, through experience that I've learned in the industry. Cloud, cloud will, will, is a good option. But if you're into serious deployment, you want to experiment with your models. You want to try multiple networks. Say, for example, you have been running th th things with, with CNNs, convolutional networks. You want to try GANs for that same problem. You know that it's going to improve the accuracy tremendously. But um, as a thumb rule, GAN, GANs need at least 2x the computational power of, of CNNs, right? But your computational power on the cloud is, is going to be clogged every minute. You're going to pay for that. Then. You were, the way you would be working in, in, in uh, um, uh, the number of hyperparameters you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be defining, the number of iterations that you would, be, the number of epochs that you would be running, the, the, the batch sizes of the problems that you'll be submitting, everything will have at the back of your head, hey, how much am I going to be charged for this? Right? That will be the always buy and run. So during that circumstances, having an on-prem infrastructure will really help you in experimenting with your models, in, in trying out newer models which you have never done before, in running more number of iterations, in increasing the batch sizes, in trying high fidelity uh, images, all those things are possible. So the, your workflow will change a lot. And if, if, if you need the real high levels of accuracy, that can be deployed. They are not like toy problems for you to play around with, to learn, but you are into serious computing, and the result of that computing is going to be deployed in actual li real life scenarios, then having an on-prem premise will work out to be cheaper in the long run. That's, that's my recommendation. So does yeah. NVIDIA offer a service where mm -hmm. I can use the Rapids platform okay, on the cloud, where I can experiment, and then once I've confirmed this... NVIDIA, sorry, sorry to... I mean, yeah, uh, NVIDIA does not offer that, but all our partners, we have partnerships with Google, with Microsoft, with the AWS, all of them do offer GPU-enabled services, and you could play around with Rapids on their services, and once you realize that it works for you, then you could think of an on-prem deployment, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, my time is up, and a pleasure talking to all of you. If you have any more questions, catch me after this, uh, 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 after this session, and please do visit our stall outside the auditorium. Thank you. <laughs>